Starship launches and goes boom, Rocket Lab announces a suborbital electron testbed, and ESA's JU spacecraft is finally on its way to Jupiter. It's Friday, the 21st of April, 2023, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Hello everyone, I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, and welcome to the first episode of This Week in Spaceflight, where we'll go over the latest news and launches that have happened during the week. For those of you who have already been listening to our podcast, you might have known that we've already been doing this for the past couple of months there, but now we're also bringing it to you via video on YouTube. This Ariane 5 lifted off from Ariane Launch Complex 3 at the Guiana Space Center on April 14th at 1214 UTC carrying the JUICE spacecraft. After an abort on April 13th due to lightning in the launch pad area, the mission finally took to the skies and JUICE was inserted very precisely into its intended trajectory towards the king of the solar system. ESA's JUICE, which stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is set to study three of Jupiter's largest moons, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. After several flybys of Earth and Venus over a span of seven years, the probe should reach the Jovian system in 2031 and perform multiple flybys of the icy moons. JUICE will be studying in depth the structure of their subsurface oceans, imaging changes in the surface of each moon, and performing readings of the radiation environment around the Jovian system. While it will take quite a few years to get to Jupiter, one can hope the wait will be worth it, as we'll surely get really cool data of those moons that will be looked at for decades to come. We're off to Slick 4 East as a Falcon 9 lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Base, carrying 51 payloads into orbit as part of SpaceX's seventh SmallSat rideshare program mission called Transporter 7. The mission debuted a new shorter nozzle extension on the Merlin vacuum engine on the upper stage that SpaceX aims to fly on missions where Falcon 9's full performance does not need to be utilized. After stage separation, the first stage also performed a new landing profile. It did a boost back burn on three engines as usual, but on entry burn it ignited only the center engine instead of three. For landing, three engines ignited in a 1-3-1 sequence for a fast landing burn down to the ground at LZ-4 in Vandenberg. This new landing profile for the booster was explained by SpaceX to be a result of the new MVAC engine nozzle extension used on the second stage, likely as a result of the lower performance. All payloads separated successfully into their intended orbits. From Slick 4E to Slick 40, Falcon 9 to another Falcon 9, SpaceX resumed launches of Starlink V2 mini-satellites this week with the launch of the Starlink Group 6-2 mission on April 19th at 1431 UTC from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The launch came about a month after the company confirmed issues with the first batch of this new design of satellites, although SpaceX never confirmed what issues popped up and how they were solving them. The booster, B-1073, successfully landed on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas, wrapping up its eighth mission, and the satellites were successfully deployed into their intended orbit. And of course, the big launch that happened this week that everyone is talking about was Starship. Not a surprise, huh? <laughs> on April 14th, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, finally granted Starship's launch license, and flocks of space nerds erupted in happiness as the big shiny rocket was finally approved for launch. Right after that, SpaceX went ahead and de-stacked Ship 24 to arm the flight termination system on both the ship and the booster. I wonder if they ever ended up needing that. The adrenaline was building, the space community was ready, SpaceX was ready, we were ready, but the first attempt on Monday ended in a scrub at T-8 minutes due to a booster pressurization issue. But no second was wasted because Mission Control treated it as a launch wet dress rehearsal from then on and were able to carry on through the countdown all the way to T-10 seconds. Throughout Tuesday and Wednesday, teams could be seen working around the bottom of B7, prepping it for the full stack second attempt. These two obviously knew they were live on our broadcast and decided to make a heart for the camera. As the clock started ticking, the pad was cleared, the tank farm spooled up, and everything was pointing towards an on-time departure of Starship on its maiden integrated voyage. 
The Starship Super Heavy vehicle finally took off on April 20th at 1333 UTC from Starbase, Texas, inaugurating itself as the world's most powerful rocket to ever reach for the heavens. It wasn't long before the problem started occurring, though, and it was the Raptors to choke first. After analyzing imagery from SpaceX from around T plus two seconds into flight, it appears as if at least two engines had already shut down. And when SpaceX started providing live telemetry at T plus 15 seconds, the graphics confirmed a third engine had cut out. As Super Heavy sprinted towards the sky, we saw another Raptor flame out, which then triggered the hydraulic power unit to evaporate in a burp of the booster's flame. It's currently being speculated that this exact event caused a lack of gimbal control, which is powered by hydraulics, in the central Raptor engines underneath Booster 7, leading to some spins in the sky before the big red automatic button was pushed to say goodbye. Surprisingly, Ship 24 never separated from the booster. There are two leading theories on why at this moment, which are, one, the mechanism operating in the clamps never engaged, or two, the Raptors under B-7 never truly cut off like they were supposed to. With debris littered across Boca Chica and a load of data to be reviewed, we are expecting at this time to see Ship 26 fly atop Booster 9 at some point in the next few months, pending any repairs and upgrades. Booster 9 already has an upgraded electric thrust vector control system, eliminating the need for the HPU, so fingers crossed that this exact issue will not occur in the future with any Raptors giving up early. Right as we were in the Monday countdown for Starship, Rocket Lab surprised us with the announcement of their brand new HASTE program. HASTE stands for Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron. As the name indicates, this program consists of flying electron rockets in suborbital trajectories to accelerate payloads to test them at hypersonic speeds. Now, For these missions, Electron's first and second stages would be largely the same, but it would incorporate a kick stage made to carry up to 700 kilograms of payload into a suborbital trajectory, targeting a hypersonic reentry. Electron can also be accommodated with special fairing configurations to adapt to different payload shapes as part of the HASTE program. Here's a look ahead at what we have coming up next week. A PSLV will launch the Talios 2 spacecraft along with the rideshare Lumilite 4 spacecraft. The flight is set for April 22nd at 8.49 UTC and will also feature another free-flying PSLV fourth stage with scientific experiments installed as part of the mission. A Falcon 9 will resume flights of Starlink Group 3 launches with the launch of Starlink Group 3-5 from Vandenberg Space Force Base on April 25th. The launch window is set to open at about 13.02 UTC. Save the date! April 25th at 16.40 UTC. That's when Japanese private aerospace company iSpace says it will have the earliest attempt at landing their Hakuto-R lander on the moon. Also on April 25th, Roscosmos plans to perform an extravehicular activity, or EVA, on the outside of the ISS. This EVA will serve to perform upgrades on Nyoka by installing an airlock on its exterior. This airlock was launched in 2010 on board Space Shuttle Atlantis along with the Rosviet module and will now finally be installed on Nyoka after 13 years. Falcon Heavy is set to come back for a launch next Wednesday. The rocket is scheduled to launch the Viasat-3 Americas satellite within a 57-minute window that opens at 2329 UTC on April 26th. This launch will not feature the recovery of any of the boosters, but we'll see the recovery of the fairing house. And that's the week that was! We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.